Hey, Anatomy and Physiology. You are uh, watching this after you've just finished your lab practical exam, um, so you guys can all work at your own pace. Good morning, Great Falls High. Today is Tuesday. So um, I'm going to go through a real quick review. Um, pretty much I'm going to go through your whole study guide packet um, in order, and then we're going to fill out those last few pieces that you don't have on yet. So. Um, get your study guide out and we're going to run through and then please don't forget to do this assignment um, many of the test questions are going to come from this and other homework assignments um, assignments you should do to review and study um, would be like any of the A01, A02, A03, A04 and then this A05 and then the Lab01 um, also has a few things um, towards the end when it's reviewing about um, that you'll see on the test. But don't worry about identifying structures um, like you did on L02 and L03 for this unit. All right, um, so first up in your notes you should have um, a axon labeled. You will see a picture of an axon on your test. It won't ask you all of these pieces but it will ask you a few What's important to remember is that this direction that the nerve impulse goes, the dendrites, I have them highlighted here, I want you to know that dendrites receive a signal. It goes down the dendrites towards this whole cell body, this whole structure here is the cell body, um, and then it goes down the axon towards the axon terminals. Um, the direction is important to know. Okay? Um, the gaps between those Schwann cells are called the nodes of Ranvier. Um, and they're wrapped in myelin sheath. And that myelin, remember, is what makes white matter white. It also makes um, action potentials fast. Okay? It speeds up action potentials or propagates them. That's why myelin is very important. Underneath that, you have your three different types of neurons that we've spent a lot of time talking about. Um, be able to identify the differences between them. You'll see that on a um, bell ringer that you should have done at the start of class today. And um, identifying the different ones and where you'd find them in the body. Um, we'll talk more about those on another page. But I have this highlighted here because your bipolar neurons that's on the test, they are responsible for your special senses and you find them in your eyes and nose, but pretty much nowhere else. This isn't a typo, this one and one over here. The multipolar neurons both have a motor function and in, they're made up of inner neurons. The unipolars are always sensory. Okay? The bipolars don't have a function really because they're just in the eyes and nose. Speaking of neurons, there is a question asking you about all of these different senses. Okay? I want to stress that the one that allows soft touch Okay, that lets you like feel the bristles of a paintbrush. These are called um, Meissner's corpsicles. Um, this is your tactile or touch receptors that help you feel things versus pressure, stretching of muscles, or pain and temperature. Okay, then you need to know what there's quite a few questions that are asking you about the functions and differences between all of your glial cells. Um, make sure you know epididymal cells circulate in cerebral spinal fluid, although they do not make them made by your choroid plexus. Microglia cells, they fight infections. So let's say you had um, an infection of your nervous system. That's what meningitis is. The meninges get swollen, so the coverings of your brain, and it's um, an infection. And so the microglial cells are going to fight off um, that infection. They're phagocytic, and they're going to protect your nervous system. Astrocytes, Okay, they protect your cells by being part of that blood-brain barrier. Oligodendrocytes make myelin, which is the same job that Schwann cells have in your peripheral nervous system. So these are in the peripheral. They also make myelin. They have the same job, same job. Okay, all right, that's important to know. Okay, moving on hi, to this cutout here or this section of the spinal cord and the neurons. This is where we get to see those neurons that were on the first page and where they fall in the spinal cord. So our unipolar neurons okay, that are sensory, the signal goes this way. Notice the arrow goes into the spinal cord this way. They have the dorsal root ganglion because that cell body's right here. Okay? Um, and they're always unipolar. 
Okay. Right here, we have that interneuron, also known as the association neuron. They're always multipolar neurons, always multipolar, like we mentioned on the previous page. And then always my motor neurons are also going to be multipolar. This signal gets sent out this direction, um, out of the spinal cord, because I'm going to have some act on my body, some motor movement. Anywhere where there's gray matter, these cells are not myelinated. So that means that this whole section, I, um, there's myelin all along this process, there's myelin all along this process. There's no myelin around the cell bodies of um, these two motor neurons or multipolar neurons. Um, and this guy's so short, it doesn't have any myelin there. So that's where there's gray matter in this kind of little um, butterfly shape. Okay, it's just literally where the cell bodies live and lie. There's not too much on the test about um, the lobes, maybe a little bit about like um, what regions deal with um, like conscious thought and reasoning. Um, but most of this stuff um, we've been covering on the lab practical. And so there's not a ton on there. You don't have to be able to identify these different special areas for the test. Um, but knowing that like the occipital lobe is important for vision, um, the primary motor cortex is where motor movement happens versus sensory and um, your auditory is there on the temporal lobe, cerebellum, balance, um, and then the brain stem. Here's a lot of your autonomic nervous system, all the automatic structures that your body does. This was mostly on the lab practical as well, so don't stress too much about rememorizing, relearning. Hopefully most of it's in your brain already. Um, do you know the order of the meninges, though, okay, from outermost to innermost, dura, um, think DAP, D-A-P, dura arachnoid pia, if that helps. Okay, moving on, these things in yellow we added recently, and so that's why they're highlighted. Same with these two, we were emphasizing them in class the other day. Um, this is just more structures of your meninges all filled out. These are all protective structures, things that are going to keep your brain protected. Fluid, cerebral spinal fluid specifically, circulates through your brain um, through these ventricles. Okay? Um, it is made in the choroid plexus. The epididymal cells, though, are going to help keeping it flowing and circulating. It's around your brain, it's inside your brain, it's around the spinal cord and inside the spinal cord. So your whole central nervous system has cerebral spinal fluid surrounding it. Okay, there's some stuff on the um, reflex arcs. You need to know these guys in order, okay? There'll be a question about what are the parts of a reflex in order. So there's a receptor, it then goes down the afferent pathway to the integration center, and then out through the efferent pathway to an effector. Um, so make sure you know these in order, that one, two, three, four, five. All effectors in our body are muscles and glands. Okay, that's the only thing our nervous system can control, muscles and glands. Okay, then we recently went over these um, outer coverings and labels. Um, not too much on the test on this because you identified it on your um, lab practical as well. Okay, this is new. Okay, so now we're going to actually write something down. All right, so this image here on page five is um, showing a synapse that's occurring between two neurons. Last time we saw a picture like this, it was called the neuromuscular junction, and it was where a synapse meets a muscle, and um, it's going to release neurotransmitter to make your muscle contract over here. Um, so this is similar, very, very similar. It just is from right here, the axon terminal of one neuron meeting up with the dendrite of another. So how does one neuron talk to another neuron is all this is showing. And it's pretty much the exact same as what we've learned before. So here we have Schwann cells. Okay, This is going to be the axon coming down though, right? meeting up down here with the dendrites of the neighboring um, neuron. Okay? So we're going to zoom in here where the axon terminal meets the dendrite of two different neurons. So here's my axon terminal, this whole thing here. This is what the end of a dendrite would look like. Um, we've got our gap. They don't touch. They look like they're touching, but they don't touch exactly. That's a synaptic cleft. It's 
same word as before. And inside this axon terminal, we have vesicles. And these synaptic vesicles, notice the green dots, they are storing neurotransmitter. So let's zoom in down here, what's going on. So this neurotransmitter is getting released from those vesicles and we have chemically gated ion channels. Notice this one's closed and this one's closed because it's got a little empty spot right there. This one is open, this one is open because the neurotransmitter is attached um, to that little receptor site. So zooming in on one of these ion channels, little green guys that you see here and here and here, those are neurotransmitters. They bind to the receptor, which opens up the channel. That allows ions to flow through. And if you remember, we'll review in a second, the action potential is all about these ch channels opening. So sodium channels open, ions rush in, and that depolarizes um, your neuron, which is what propagates or sends um, an action potential. So it's just about opening these gates. And all it is is a neurotransmitter binding to those ion channels. That's it. When you stop sending a signal, any leftover neurotransmitter in the area gets broken down by an enzyme. So you would have, if it was acetylcholine, it'd be acetylcholine esterase that's going to break down acetylcholine, which is a type of neurotransmitter. Um, that way you don't accidentally send signals when you don't mean to. That's it. I exact same thing as the muscular system. Nothing really new here. Um, they just communicate the same way. There's lots of different types of neurotransmitters. In psychology, you might get into that a little bit more, uh, but we won't here. Okay. This isn't actually in the packet, but we've gone through all of the pictures at this point, and um, we're about to go into the flow charts. And I just wanted to review with you what does your nervous system do? It has three functions. And you should have this written probably on the very back of your um, packet where you had um, just a blank page of notes. Um, but it senses, okay, the world around you. You've got all of your special senses that sense. Um, then you decide what you're going to do. And then you have a motor movement. You either speak like Mrs. Lloyd is doing. You might pick up something, you might walk to a different room, um, or you might secrete a hormone through your glands. Um, but that's it. It's just about information coming in, your brain deciding what to do, and the motor output. That's all your nervous system actually does, but it's crazy how much stuff that you can control. You also have, hopefully on the back, this little drawing sketched out. Um, talking about the organization of the nervous system. I'm about to go into this almost the exact same thing, though, right here. So that same chart is pretty much just carbon copied onto this little flow chart, which is on page 9 of your packet. So our nervous system is organized into the central nervous system, which you know is your what two organs, brain and spinal cord. And then the peripheral nervous system is everything that branches off of my spinal cord. So it could be my cranial nerves or my peripheral nerves, those two things. Now, I have things that um, I can sense that come in to my spinal cord, and then I have things that go out. Um, and so that sensory, the information coming in is also known as the afferent division or afferent pathway. These two words are interchangeable. Interchangeable. The motor or efferent pathway is what gets sent out. Right? Now, when my body is deciding what it's going to do, it's going to decide if it's going to do things automatically, things I don't have to consciously think about, or things that I do decide that I want to do. And so those are the somatic and autonomic parts of your nervous system. So the somatic part of my nervous system is involved, or sorry, is voluntary. This is like right now is speaking. I'm voluntarily doing this. I'm choosing to do this. When I click the slide, I'm choosing to do that. That's all my somatic nervous system. Meanwhile, I'm breathing. My heart is beating. Hormones are being released. Maybe sweat glands are being activated because my room, as normal, is pretty toasty. Those things are going to be controlled by the involuntary or autonomic nervous system. 
And then that system gets broken down into one more division, which is sympathetic and parasympathetic, your fight or flight or your rest and digest. So my sympathetic nervous system is when I am stressed or fearful for my life. I, I get startled, I get scared, something to that effect. That's when my fight or flight kicks in. This is going to do a lot of different things in my body, but usually elevate my everything, breathing rate, heart rate. My eyes are going to dilate so I can see more stuff. My um, mitochondria are going to work faster to produce more ATP. My muscles are going to be more responsive to my nervous system. Everything is kicking on in high gear. I don't want to live in my sympathetic nervous system, though, because there's long-term negative effects of um, high blood pressure. I... Um, high blood pressure, those are the examples I can think of, um, because of excess blood flowing when it shouldn't be. So hopefully, most of the time, I'm relaxed and I'm in my parasymp parasympathetic nervous system. This is the time period where I'm going to rest and digest. My food is going to get settled um, and I will be um, just living my normal life, hopefully comfortably. My breathing rate will be at a normal pace. My blood pressure will be relatively low. Um, if you're stressed though, even though you might not be in a life or death situation, um, stress puts us into the sympathetic nervous system. And so stress can elevate blood pressure, heart rate, and things that you necessarily don't want to be elevated all the time. All right, the nervous system functions. Again, this kind of picture, this is literally these three things. My nervous system functions to sense the world around me, to decide what to do, integration, and then to have some action, motor, okay, output. That's it. That's all my nervous system does. All right. These notes we've already taken. Um, I highlighted um, white matter here just to stress again you're going to see on the test that white matter is myelinated and um, when it is myelinated it's specifically here in the central nervous system we really don't call nerves white matter um, although they have myelin on them but we just don't give it that term white matter and by the way these two should be two T's, not mater, like the meninges, it should be matter. All right, and then we have, um, let's see, what else do I want to tell you on this? This is just going through the structures of your cell body. Um, the tracks are essentially pathways where nerves run up and down your spinal cord to your brain, but you also have tracks in your brain where things are going between your right and left hemisphere, your corpus callosum that connects the two, um, there's tracks that run through that that connect the two sides. All right, and then here's a review of those neurons and a review of those neuroglia cells. You do need to know a little bit, not a ton, but a little bit on um, the action potential or your nerve impulse. Um, you should know that when we say a neuron is at rest, it's polarized. It means it has two charges, a positive and negative on opposite sides. You should also know the order of these events, okay, and a brief description of what's happening. You don't need to, this will be multiple choice, so you don't have to like write out the whole thing that's going on. But as a quick review, at rest, you're at negative 70 millivolts because of the positive and negative displacement polarized. You have to reach the threshold, which is at negative 55. This is, you will not send a signal if the signal is not strong enough. So it has to be more than negative 55 or else the signal doesn't go. It doesn't propagate or get sent. Once it reaches threshold, then the sodium channel gates open up and you see um, that the membrane that was polarized becomes depolarized. So this is changing the positives and negatives, flip-flopping them. Then there's a transition where sodium gates close, potassium gates open, and on the downslope here, we start to repolarize. We're trying to get back to that negative 70. And then there's this hyperpolarization right here where it goes a little bit too far down, and then we return to a resting state thanks to those sodium-potassium pumps. Um, 
now about the speed. Okay, I already mentioned this. Myelin speeds up an action potential because the signal leaps between the nodes of Ranvier. And because it can jump, it speeds it up and it goes much more quickly um, than a non-myelinated axon. And so myelin helps this go faster. It propagates a nerve impulse more quickly. Um, and when there's myelin, it's called a saltatory um, propagation. It means it's jumping between those nodes. These are just screenshots from the videos we watched in class to review those concepts. Polarized means positive outside, negative inside. Right? Um, this goes through those steps that I just reviewed with you with the action potential. Um, this is showing you the propagation of an action potential. And notice, or if you remember on the video, it blipped every place at these nodes of Ranvier, um, or Ranvier. So it beep, 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 beep. It jumps over all of these as the signal propagates down and it goes much more quickly. So this is just showing you what's happening on the axon is the flip-flopping of those charges. Right? Positive on the outside, negative on the inside. At rest, when it's sending the signal, the action potential, those charges flip. Right? We have a negative outside, positive inside. All because of those ion gates opening and closing. Have this highlighted because you should know the order. Right? Um, you don't have to know necessarily all of these details about what's happening, um, but you should know what these words mean. What does it mean at rest? What does it mean threshold? What's depolarized, transition repolarized, hyperpolarized? I just know what those terms refer to that we just reviewed. You already have these notes filled out then on page 10, I believe. And um, you have just the structures. Most of this stuff was connected to your um, lab practical that you took. But I, you should know the things that protect the brain, your bones, the meninges, cerebral spinal fluid, and the blood-brain barrier, thanks to those astrocytes. Um, and you should know kind of the brief descriptions and differences between the regions of the brain. Cerebral hemisphere is where a lot of your thinking happens. Um, you've got the hill in the valleys, the gyri and sulci. The corpus callosum connects to the right and left, and then you've got your different lobes. Um, then you have your diencephalon that does a lot of the kind of processing of information and connection of the two halves to each other. Brainstem is mostly autonomic functions. The medulla oblongata, this one is responsible for your breathing rates, um, and your heart rates, a lot of those automatic things. Of all of the parts of the brainstem you need to know, medulla oblongata has a lot of those autonomic functions, breathing, heart rate, um, things like that. Um, cerebellum, balance and coordination. And that, that's about it there. All right, wrapping up, guys. So this very last one, okay, is, um, actually, I keep my face up here, because our picture is going to show up here. So we have this picture that we already labeled. Um, our nerves, here's our nerve, is wrapped in connective tissues. The innermost one that surrounds an individual axon right here is an endoneurium. When we take a bunch of those nerves together and wrap it in a fascicle, it's a perineurium, which forms fascicles. And then the very outer covering is the epineurium. Now, our nerves also are broken up into cranial and peripheral nerves. You have not had to learn the cranial nerves. In college, I promise you will. And you have to memorize them, their locations, and the differences between them and what they control. Now, it just wasn't enough time really to cover that in this unit. Um, but they're numbered, usually by Roman numerals. There's 12 pairs, so there's a, a copy on each side. Um, and there's all kinds of like um, memory ways to like remember where they are and what they do. Um, and so anyways, that's something you would, not for this test, but I just wanted to show you a picture of what those cranial nerves look like. The other thing you did not have to memorize and learn for this test was the peripheral nerves. There's 31 of them. Now this picture is a little bit blurry, uh, but learning like which ones come off of um, 
which branches of your spinal cord is a part of most college level anatomy and physiology classes. We learned a lot of structures of the brain, but we didn't do much on the nerves. And then um, our peripheral nervous system, I want to note that it has its own autonomic nervous system as well. So those things that help control my fight and flight and rest and digest also are part of my nerves too. Um, and I have automatic responses to stressful situations. And so the terms are the same here, parasympathetic, which is my rest and digest, and sympathetic, which is your fight and flight. Um, but you have your autonomic nervous system, that's what the ANS of the PNS, the peripheral nervous system, is refer referencing here. Okay, um, this is just a list of the different things that your parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system do, um, and you can kind of see like if you cared what um, branch of the ner nerves where it came off of, um, but these are all times when I'm relaxed. I, um, keeping my bladder contracted so I don't pee my pants, that's when I'm at rest, right? Um, but in a stressful situation, your body might relax your urinary bladder. So if you're very, very fearful, you might pee your pants because literally the muscles are relaxing because it's like we got to pay attention to everything else here. And so th that's one effect of your fight or flight, okay, over here. Um, in general, my heart rate is reduced. Um, my bronchi are limiting how much airflow is getting into my lungs. Um, I'm going to have plenty of saliva. My pupils are more constricted. Um, my digestive system is working properly. All that good stuff. Um, now, if I am fearful, okay, my pupils are going to dilate, with basically letting in more light so I can see what's going on around me. Um, not going to produce saliva, interestingly enough, because who needs that when you are um, fearful? My bronchi are going to dilate so more air can get into my lungs, and my heart rate is going to increase so I can get more oxygen to all the cells of my body. It's going to turn off my digestive system, because who needs to digest food if you're trying to save your life? Um, but the big thing here is my adrenal medulla. That's your adrenal gland. I think adrenaline is going to be released and all of these effects are going to take place. We'll learn more about the adrenal gland in the endocrine system. Um, all right. And um, I always say this before the test. I highly recommend you guys do the crossword puzzle, although it's not graded, because lots of good terms and words for you to review on there. When you guys come to class before your test, we will do the concept map review any other questions that you might have for me and we will go from there. Thank you guys um, for watching and taking your test today. Um, happy studying. Don't forget to do your homework.